Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Westwood Myron Taylor Lectureship on Preaching. The Westwood Lectureships grew out of lectures that took place at Westwood Hills Christian Church in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Taylor was a graduate of Johnson Bible College. After years of distinguished ministry, his alma mater conferred on him the Doctor of Divinity degree. In the intervening years, he completed the Master of Divinity degree at Butler School of Religion. And after having served ministries in Indiana, Ohio, and Georgia, he became the senior minister of the Westwood Christian Church in Los Angeles, where he served for 30 years. And upon retirement, he was named Minister Emeritus of the congregation, located across the street from UCLA. Dr. Taylor served for many years as a trustee of what was then called Emmanuel School of Religion and was an adjunct professor of preaching here. In 1996, the Westwood Foundation Lectureship Endowment Fund created the Myron Taylor Lectures in Preaching and Pastoral Ministry, and the Emanuel Village has a cottage named in honor of Dr. Taylor and his wife, Sarah Jean. Dr. Taylor was known as an intelligent preacher, someone who would write out sermon manuscripts and even include footnotes in his manuscripts. He published several collections of his sermons through the Emanuel School of Religion Press and was an ardent supporter of the school's Stone Campbell heritage. The Myron Taylor Lectures in Preaching focus on preaching as well as the work and role of pastoral ministry. This year's lectureship theme, The Gift of Reconciliation, highlights the role a minister of the gospel has in bringing people from different backgrounds and ideologies together under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Our speaker for this year's lecture is Emmanuel Katongale. Father Katongale comes to us from Uganda by way of Belgium, North Carolina, and most recently South Bend, Indiana, and the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Father Katongale has written extensively on issues relating to how God is working in and through the Church of Africa as well as the whole world. He is professor of theology and peace studies, holds a joint appointment with the Keough School of Global Affairs, where he serves as a full-time faculty member of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. Please join me in welcoming Emmanuel Katongale. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Greer, for the warm welcome and introduction and invitation to be here at Emmanuel uh, Seminary, uh, Michigan University. What Pro Dr. Greer forgot to mention is that the Emmanuel, <laughs> in the Emmanuel College, Emmanuel Seminary, is this Emmanuel. I am coming to my seminary. <laughs> so I, I should really I should need no introduction. <laughs> In fact, I thought that what Dr. Greer was going to do was to give me the tribute <laughs> that is owed to me all these years <laughs> that you all have been at this my seminary. <laughs> During the period of Advent, we Catholics sing, and I'm sure you also as well, many Christians sing, O come, O come, O Emmanuel. Well, I think that was uh, uh, two years ago when I got uh, an email from Dr. Gary Serby uh, saying, Emmanuel, come. <laughs> Where? You know, like the period of Advent is a period of waiting. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> I think all is to say, careful what you pray for. <laughs> I'm grateful uh, to the Dean, Dean Ramsaran, for the invitation to be here. I'm grateful uh, to my brother, uh, Kip, who has coordinated this. And, and to you all. 
a lovely time last evening uh, meeting the faculty and sharing conversation and fellowship. It was really a delightful, delightful time. Uh, for me, it is really an honor to be here. And thank you for taking the time uh, to be here this morning, this day, as we journey together, as we have a conversation together about the heart of Christian ministry, about the goal and the heart of preaching in that Christian ministry that is about a Christian life. When Professor Serbi emailed me, <clears throat> he said, we really would love for you to provide a coherent theological framework or perspective on hope and reconciliation that can frame the preaching ministry of the church. I could not but think about reconciliation in terms of the invitation. The theologian John Milbank says that the goal of Christian theology is to announce the Christian mythos and to tell it in such a way so as to recover its freshness in the world and to display the Christian difference. So when I think about the gift of reconciliation, I think about it in terms of that invitation. The gift of reconciliation, the external gift of reconciliation, as the invitation into Christian life, into Christian ministry. And Christian life, Christian ministry, Christian preaching in particular is an opportunity for us to tell again and again the story of God's reconciliation and to tell it in such a way that it recovers its freshness in the world, that it displays its rich possibilities in the world, and that invites others into that journey of God's reconciliation toward a new creation. <clears throat> Excuse me. In his second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 16 to 20, Paul writes, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone in Christ, a new creation, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God we are making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled. To God. Let me begin by sharing a little bit about my own journey of how I came to discover this extraordinary gift of reconciliation and how I came to appreciate that it is at the heart of Christian life, it is at the heart of Christian ministry, in particular on pre about Christian preaching. I was born and raised in Uganda. I went to seminary in Uganda and became a priest for Kampala Archdiocese. I did not think about my ministry in terms of reconciliation, except when it came to the sacrament of reconciliation. I say this because for many Catholics, when you talk about reconciliation, immediately it evokes or it is connected or it means the sacrament of penance, the sacrament of 
of reconciliation. I didn't think about it in this kind of overarching broad framework. I did my graduate studies in Belgium at the Catholic University of Louvain and did my PhD in philosophy on the role of tradition and narrative in moral rationality. Uh, working uh, with the work of people like Stanley Howras and Alistair McIntyre. Reconciliation was not on my mind. In 2001, I came to Duke Divinity School as a visiting professor. Again, reconciliation was not on my radar. My research was on politics, on violence and the social imagination. Looking back now, I see that my work was interesting, but for the most part, it remained abstract because I engaged all these issues called like conditions of possibility, transcendental frames of reference, epistemological frameworks that I thought were interesting. And indeed, they were interesting from one point of view. I didn't have reconciliation as part of that vision of my work. But that all changed in 2004. Two years before that, a gentleman named Chris Rice had come from Mississippi where he had spent 17 years working with John Perkins at Voice of Calvary, a ministry of reconciliation. And he came to Duke Divinity School for an MDiv program. He came and enrolled in one of my classes and we became friends. Then he was asked the following year to convene an issue group as part of the Lausanne movement for evangelization that was to take place in Pattaya, Thailand. So Chris came to me and said, well, Emmanuel, I want you to be part of this issue group in Pattaya, Thailand on reconciliation. I said, what? <laughs> yeah, I want you to be part of that. I said, I don't think so. First of all, I don't do reconciliation. <laughs> and secondly, Lausanne, from my Catholic sensibility, sounds too evangelical for me. <laughs> so I turned down uh, the invitation. But he came back and said, well, Emmanuel, this, this actually is going to be an interesting experience. You should consider it. So partly out of the friendship and partly out of curiosity, I said yes. And we prepared for this issue group that was to culminate in a meeting in Pattaya of issue group number 22 on the reconciliation. So as we prepared for the Lausanne um, uh, assembly, we gathered a number of people to be part of this issue group on reconciliation, mostly from mainline Protestant and evangelical churches understandably. But also, we invited two other Catholics. By that time, Chris and I were committed to provide a kind of interruption to whatever discussion was going on around reconciliation. And as we got ready for Lausanne, there were a number of people that we met who described themselves as reconcilers. Are very activists and they gave us a lot of advice on what we needed to do mostly give us the skills give us the tools give us the how to do reconciliation well we started saying wait, 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 wait a minute perhaps we need to step back and get into the deeper story of what is reconciliation one of our friends, I remember, uh, even got frustrated and said, Chris and Emmanuel, the world is on fire. What we need is water and water hoses. And now you are kind of taking us into all this endless a kind of speculation about what is the constitution story. I said, well, but before we kind of come to, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. There is a whole description uh, in 2 Corinthians that Paul engages in relation to the issue of reconciliation. 
reconciliation is first and foremost not our mission but God's mission. In the Atlo Zen, uh, we offered uh, with this issue group what we had found, again grounding uh, this discussion of reconciliation in the story of God. But what was most significant for me was the last day of the Lausanne Assembly. Uh, this big hotel, over 3,000 people, where each, each, each group was given 10 minutes to present this finding. It was very, very well organized. You could see that the organizers of this conference were American. Everything was very, uh, <laughs> very, 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 very well organized and so forth. So, and we didn't know how to summarize what we had, uh, in a way, uh, spent two years discovering about reconciliation. So what we did was a ritual, a foot washing. And in the foot washing, we called on the stage uh, eight people. Uh, a Hutu and a Tusi from Rwanda. A Palestinian and an Israeli from the Middle East. An evangelical mainline and a Catholic representative. And an American and a Cuban Christian. And as one of us kind of read the commentary, they did the foot washing. In a word, we said, that is what reconciliation is all about. And we started using and talking about a new we. A new we that had emerged, that was being displayed, that is neither Palestinian, nor Israeli, neither Hutu, nor Tos. We started using that language of a new way. Anyway, following Lausanne in October 2004, I was ready to go back to my uh, philosophical, uh, political, social imagination stuff when the Dean Greg Jones invited me and Chris to work together and establish a center for reconciliation to continue the kind of work that we had done to us. That I can say is how I got hooked, really, into reconciliation. That is how I discovered reconciliation, or rather, that is how reconciliation discovered me and saved me. That is when I was born again, again. The gift of reconciliation. So as we continue to work really around this notion of reconciliation, we were drawn back over and over again, as we should be, to scripture, the story of God in scripture, to discover the foundation of reconciliation. And we discovered, and the biblical scholars among you we, uh, uh, let me know if I'm wrong, that actually reconciliation is a New Testament terminology. Fifteen times in the New Testament, and 13 of those are in the letters of Paul. So it is a Pauline terminology, the language of reconciliation comes from Paul, 13 times in the letter of Paul. In this text of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 16 that I just read, already in that brief text, Paul refers to reconciliation five times. So five out of the 13, are already in this text of 2 Corinthians. But even without getting into the exegetical, hermeneutic, and uh, background of this text, uh, there is something unique of what Paul is doing in this text. A number of elements stand out. And so we regarded Christ from a human point of view, even though um, we no longer do. Anyone in Christ no creation. For Paul, this is the good news. My former colleague, Richard Hayes, the New Testament scholar, constantly told us that the way it is most rendered in most of the New Testament versions is actually misleading that what Paul is doing in the original Greek text is something like, if anyone in Christ, new creation. Not there is a new creation, not he, she is a new creation, not that he's a... He's poised to celebrate. Anyone in Christ, new creation. 
the old is gone, the new is here. He's announcing, he's celebrating the new creation, the good news of that new creation. But notice also how for Paul, this is a lens, a way of seeing. We once saw differently. We once regarded from Christ from a human point of view. We no longer do. It's like we have put on new lenses now. We see things differently. So reconciliation is into a new vision, into a new way of seeing the world and therefore of living in the world. But notice also how powerful Paul, all this is from God. And we need to pause there and say, all this is a gift. Total gift. That God is given freely, gratuitously. All this is from God. For Paul, this is very, very, very significant. So before we jump into how do we do it, what should we do? This is a kind of movement that is coming from God as a totally unexpected gift. And of course it is reflecting in Paul's own journey. The one who used to persecute uh, <coughs> Christians on the road to Damascus, this light that uh, blinds him and so forth. He is reflecting on that, his own journey, how it is a total gift that the persecutor now becomes a key evangelist for Christ. Reflecting Paul's own experience. But the significance of all this is from God, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, that this is God's work, God's ongoing work. It's not just kind of an event, it God himself, that is, God was reconciling the world, has been reconciling an ongoing journey that begins from creation to revelation. So the whole of scripture in a way kind of displaying that movement of God or as some words would say a drama, the whole of scripture in five parts. God doing this reconciling work in creation, first part, God in doing this work in Israel, through Israel, from the covenant on, the second stage of the drama, God continuing the reconciling work in Christ, the climax of that uh, movement of God, God doing this work of reconciliation through the church, in the church, the fourth part of the drama, and finally through the eschaton, the end time. So the whole of scripture, the whole of uh, is about this God's ongoing work. God was reconciling the word. Uh, and Paul, it all happens in Christ. And Christos, that happens over 160 times in the Pauline letters. One of Paul's most favorite expressions, in Christ. It happens in Christ. In the Christ event, something decisively, decisive has happened in the history of human. God, in a way, has been doing that let continue to do that. But in Christ, we have come to a certain uh, realization of that. And then that's where I think Paul comes up, improvises really, in order to explain what God has been doing, improvises with this word of reconciliation. Catalago, catalasi, that he kind of borrows from uh, the Greek, uh, Roman, uh, uh, sorry, the Roman uh, legal uh, framework. Right? For example, if you offended husband and wife of what kind of how do they make amends and so forth then Paul uses that, that that word in kind of like in order to continue to display what has happened God in a way bringing us together we who were uh, far from uh, that that, that, that law it's only at the end that he comes to the point and says now we therefore having received this gift are ambassadors of reconciliation assigned in or wherever we are assigned to live as ambassadors of that gift of reconciliation. It's therefore misleading to begin with the ambassadors. What shall we do? Where, where do we go from here? We, we need to take time just kind of to, to see the whole movement of that gift 
of God's reconciliation as it happens in Christ. For me, this was totally revolutionary, as it was indeed for Paul. Because for Paul, this is the summary of the gospel, the summary of the good news. And I had never personally come to a good sense of what is the summary of the good news. Or have you? What is it that God is doing in the world? What is the drama that you are part of? Unless we each come to that clear realization of the big picture. What is the big picture that this is all about? For me, this is what he did for me. I said, oh, all right. This, this is the big picture. So everything, in a way, is an invitation into this drama. Which means also scholarship. For me, this changed actually my scholarship. I began to see from then on that all scholarship, in fact, all human engagement is nothing but being drawn and being part of this drama. It's an invitation. Scholarship, therefore, is an invitation to illumine this gift of God's reconciliation in the world. To articulate it, as Milbank says, this mythos, to articulate it in such a way so as to recover its freshness, to display its possibilities, and to invite others into the same drama. My scholarship then got on a certain kind of form of urgency, where there is something at stake here. Uh, Honestly, if you compare me, if you compare my previous work, books I published before, Beyond Universal Reason, interesting books and so forth for graduate students and so forth, and my more recent work, I began to see that unless Christian scholarship is able to articulate this mythos of God's reconciling love, then it loses the point for which it exists. My teaching, as some of my students say, is kind of homiletic. It becomes more homiletic. But I guess the whole of Christian life is supposed to be homiletic. It is a form of preaching. It is a form of being ambassadors. This is the kind of the ambassadorial presence that we are, or that we are all to bring in the world. Everything is drawing attention to what God is doing in the world and to invite others into that drama. That was revolutionary for me. The two, I began to see more and more how it is a revolution. God was reconciling the world to himself, continues to do that. And that is a revolution of tenderness, a revolution of mercy. As Pope Francis reminds us, that Christ became human so as to draw us into that revolution of God's reconciling love. There's something revolutionary. The word looks different, Paul says, if you stand within that drama. Um, and thirdly, I began to see that one of the practical import of that is to live as if from a different planet. That is the story of Paul. But that's also the story of people like Angelina Atiam. Angelina Atiam is a woman in northern Uganda. In northern Uganda, over the years, there's conflict between the government and the Lord's Resistance Army. Many of you uh, may know something about uh, uh, the Lord's Resistance Army through the, uh, what's the what's the name of the movie, the clip that was published to get Connie back I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting but how, how many of you are familiar with the story of Northern Uganda and Connie yeah, alright what's this thing, the group of young people that were doing activism and get get Connie arrested. Anyway, we, we remember that. Okay. The story I want to tell is one of Angelina Atiam, one of the women, a midwife, whose daughters were abducted by the Lord's Resistance Army, together with 138 girls from a Catholic high school 
and we are marched off by Connie and his militia rebels into the bush to turn them into uh, rebel wives. Angelina's daughter was 14 when she was abducted. They were taken off. The principal of the high school went after the rebels and was able to catch up with a, one of the section of the rebels and demanded forcefully that the girls be released. So they released 109 girls and remained uh, with the others, including Angelina's daughter, and they were marched off into, into the bush. The parents, as Angelina would tell the story, the parents could not believe this tragedy. And so they would come together every time to pray, to advocate for the release of their daughters. And they would come together, especially every Saturday at the cathedral. That's where they would meet. And they would do, uh, call upon the local leaders, the government, on God, to do something about the release of the girls. And they would end in a prayer. They attempted to pray the Our Father. When they came to the words, forgive us our sins, they just couldn't go on. The pain was too deep. He said, how could we forgive people like the Lord's Resistance Army and Connie for abducting our girls? So they would go home and they would come back five weekends they would do that and every time they couldn't get over the words forgive us our sins it was just too much as angelina tells the story at some point something was moving in their lives she came on weekend number six and told them you know we are wasting our time if we are praying to god to forgive us our sins and then we are holding too tightly on the bitterness and the anger unless we learn ourselves also to release and forgive. They couldn't believe what she was saying. So the following weekend when they came back again, they found actually that they were able to pray the Our Father up to the end. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. She says, we found that something had happened within us, a certain power had overcome, that had overcome us, and that we were able actually to forgive uh, the rebels. But that same moment actually intensified, she says, intensified our advocacy. It's as if it kind of released new energy. So they wanted to go to the radio, to the government, calling for an end to war, and for Connie, uh, to release the girls. The, the activity was so intensified over the public radio that one time Angelina is speaking on the radio and the rebels call in on the radio and they wanted to meet with her. So they arranged a meeting and she went and met with one of the top commanders of the rebels. And the top commander said, we will release your daughter if we will stop making all this public campaign, which was actually negatively affecting them, bad publicity. <laughs> so people say there is no such a thing as a bad publicity. Well, <laughs> this was very bad publicity for, for the rebels. And Angelina says, that's good. Only my daughter. What about the other the nine girls? He said, no, no, no. We said only your daughter. Then Angelina says, well, in that case, I will not stop because every child is my child. So she went back home and her husband and the, the, the siblings are waiting. So, mom, what happened? And she narrates the story. I said, how could you do that? How could you sacrifice your own daughter? And she says, we are in all this together with all the other parents. Every child is my child. And so she continues now to uh, her minister of uh, forgiveness and then even extends forgiveness to the mother of one of the top commanders that she met, the very top commander that actually was holding her daughter in captivity to extend 
the gift of forgiveness. This woman was also very isolated because everybody knew that her son had run away and joined the rebels. So she was one of these rebel commanders and nobody wanted to talk to this woman. This woman could not believe when Angelina came and said, I am coming to you as a mother. I know you didn't have a choice in your son, but I just want to come to say, I understand and we share the pain. So they spent the whole afternoon, two women embracing, crying together for their children. Angelina, every child is my child. And then as she continues to speak about forgiveness in the community, she comes to this elderly woman whose only grandson had been abducted by the rebels. She's blind, this woman, and Angelina again communicates the message of forgiveness. And this woman looks at her and says, Do you know what the rebels did? I had only one grandson. He was my everything. You see, I'm blind. He was going to bring me food, to bring me water. Now I'm all alone here. And you tell us about this forgiveness? Angelina. Are you from a different planet? Are you from a different planet? This incredible gift that Angelina receives and her fellow parents that transformed their bitterness into an, an advocacy for forgiveness, that transformed their individual understanding who is in and who is out, who is my child and who is not my child, to every child is my child. That energized their advocacy in such a way that they are willing even to sacrifice their daughters. That can only be possible if you operate as if you are from a different planet. And that's the extraordinary gift of reconciliation. That's what happens to Paul. And that's what happens to Angelina. And that's what happens to us. If we receive that gift of reconciliation. If we see that movement. That this is actually the good news. And our role, our first place in that. Is not to be ambassador. No, 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 no. Our first place is to receive. Is to stand in awe and wonder. Wow. <laughs> see what has happened to us. God is reconciling us before we kind of get too activist about what we should do, how we should go uh, and reconcile others, how kind of receiving that gift. The external gift that uh, Angelina received in the seventh year of the captivity of her daughter, she wakes up in the middle of the night. She remembers that it had been seven years since the captivity of her daughter. She goes down from her bed and sits down at the foot of her bed and cries to God and say, God, where are you? Why must the pain of a mother be so painful? It's been seven years. And you promise that every seventh year is a year of release. It's a year of jubilee. Have you changed? When you went down to Bethany, why did you cry when Lazarus died? So, she, an hour, an hour and a half, and she fell asleep. When she woke up, she realized there was a missed call. And an hour later, the same call came back it was the police officer saying, can you come down to the police station? We have a young woman here with two, two kids. Uh, she might be actually your daughter. So Angelina went to the police station and indeed it was her daughter. And she had two kids from the rebels. She had escaped. That very night actually, that Angelina was in agony, in lament, in prayer. As this young woman tells the story, 
she had a dream when she was sleeping telling her turn to the left turn to the left and then she almost had somebody kind of shaking her to wake up she woke up and realized there was commotion in the camp the voice kept telling her can't turn to the left and so she just took the two kids that she had and just kept going to the left and left and left the minute the camp the militia camp was being bombarded and she was able to escape that very night the first child Angelina's daughter had named Abonga Khan in Iruo means everything is possible for God the second child the rebel commander had insisted that it be named after him as a boy that it be named after him and when Angelina received the, her daughter back he says no that is not his name his name is miracle his name is miracle this external gift of forgiveness is at the same time a miracle a miracle that indeed invites us to see the world in a new way but also that continues to accompany us on that journey with unexpected gifts and miracles even as we are grounded in a journey of lament let me conclude with three conclusions one christian ministry preaching in particular starts here in discovering the big picture of what god is doing in the world discovering the big picture remembering the drama welcoming and receiving the gift and inviting others into its many possibilities into that revolution of tenderness into that revolution of god's reconciling love but the movement is about first of all remembering receiving welcoming before the invitation of others the big picture the second conclusion good preaching is about stories stories are the stuff of christian ministry of good preaching stories moving back and forth between the story of scripture the drama in its five parts and the stories of individuals your own story the story of others individuals like Angelina Atcham and others that you have seen that exemplify something about this extraordinary gift of reconciliation and invitation stories matter the third conclusion the purpose of Christian preaching is to highlight hope. St. Peter, first letter of St. Peter, chapter 5, verse 15 says, Always be willing to give an account of the hope that is in you. Christian preaching is about telling, displaying hope. Hope in the journey as we find ourselves in that sluggish between of the already and not yet Paul says the old is gone the new is here reconciliation is real it has been realized in the Christ event it is here already but the same Paul says but we continue on in fact not only us but the entire creation groans as we long as we move towards the final liberation of the children of God as the final parousia so we live in this sluggish in between of that already and not yet Christian preaching is about hope in that between the hope of that journey toward a new creation and the gifts unexpected gifts we find ourselves as we journey toward the full realization of God's new creation my dear friends Christian life Christian ministry preaching is a precious gift 
The goal of Christian ministry, Christian preaching, is to announce the Christian mythos. Is to tell again and again the story of God's reconciling love in the world. Is to tell it in such a way so as to recover its freshness, to display its possibilities in the world, and to invite others into the journey that it makes possible. And for this, we are grateful. Thank you.